Hello everyone, um, and welcome to my talk on peer-to-peer -peer hole punching without centralized infrastructure. Uh, I'm Max, and before we dive into I want to make sure here to give a great shout out to all the folks organizing FOSDEM 2022. Uh, I've been to quite a lot of them by now, and I'm very happy, excited that um, there is another one this year. So thank you very much for organizing all of this and making all of this happen. As I said, Max, I'm a software developer at Protocol Apps. I'm stewarding the Lip2P project, so I'm all over the place whenever it comes to Lip2P, but mostly am I maintaining the Lip2P Rust implementation. In a past life, even though I'm still a little bit involved, I've been helping to maintain Prometheus, so you might have seen me around on that. And I've been mostly working on the integration of Prometheus into the Kubernetes ecosystem. You can find me pretty much anywhere on the web with MX Inton on all the different platforms, and if you want to find out more about me, you can visit my website as well. So today we're going to talk about hole punching, but we'll do so in the context of Lip2P. So let, let me first introduce Lip2P. Uh, Lip2P is an open source project, fully open source, and it's a, it's a modular, as the name suggests already, peer-to-peer -peer networking library. Now, um, Lip2P is composed of a shared core and then many building blocks around that. Those building blocks and also the shared core are fully specified and then implemented in many different languages. Uh, I would say seven plus languages somewhere there, even though some languages are more ahead and some are a little bit more behind, though all sharing some common uh, logic. Given that libp is implemented in so many different languages, uh, libp runs on many runtimes or environments or however you want to call it. So for example, if you use JS libp2p or Rust libp2p compiled to WebAssembly, you can then run within the browser. You can run on mobile with Java libp2p um, and for example, Rust libp2p. You can run on embedded, you can run on servers, you can run on laptops, you can pretty much run anywhere. Now, um, libp2p in itself is not very useful, but uh, used in a larger network, it is. So for example, um, libp2p today is used within IPFS IPFS actually being the project that libp2p is born out of. So back then, libp2p was the sole network la layer of IPFS, and at some point, some brave souls decided to make it its own project. So nowadays, obviously, libp2p powers IPFS, but also Ethereum 2, Filecoin, or for example, the Polkadot network, and many more. Now, it is a little bit hard to estimate how many um, live nodes are out there. I would estimate something around 100,000 at any point in time, even though it is a little bit hard, again, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, especially since there are firewalls and nets. And that's, I think, a good bridge to get over to our next topic, or the topic of this talk, actually, um, the problem with firewalls and nets and how we're going to solve it with hole punching, hopefully. Okay, so let's first define the problem of the talk. Uh, pretty much firewalls and nets is a good summary. Um, let's imagine we have two people that want to connect to each other, A and B. And now each of them uh, have their laptop in front of each other, and um, they're connected to the internet over some home network with a router in between, each in a separate network. Right? So now the problem um, is that A cannot connect to B directly, and B cannot connect to A directly. Um, I'm oversimplifying a lot of things here, but let's just imagine A tries to establish a SYN connection, uh, TCP IP SYN, um, sends a TCP IP SYN to B, that SYN would be sent to router A, would then be forwarded to router B. Router B would see that SYN coming from A, but would not see any SYN coming the other way or any packets coming the other way from B to A, thus not really seeing a port mapping within its state table and simply dropping the SYN. Now, below is the exact same situation again, but mirrored, so B sends a TCP SYN out to its router that forwards it to router A. Uh, router A does not have a port mapping from A to B, thus it drops the SYN. Now, there is no real way for A and B to connect with this setup, but we can solve all of this with hole punching. Now, hole punching, the idea is to punch holes in one's firewall. And this is happening here, for example, where A and B, through some magical mechanism, we'll go into what that magical mechanism is, and they decide to connect to each other at the same time, pretty much at the same time. So A sends a SYN and B sends a SYN. And each of these SYNs, punch a hole into the firewalls of router A and router B. So A punches a hole in its own firewall and B punches a hole into its own firewall. Now, those two SYNs, one from A, one from B, at some magical point somewhere in the internet, cross path, right? They don't really cross path, but I think it's a good, good image to have in mind. And now the SYN from B arrives at router A 
And given that A previously punched a hole here, um, this sin is then forwarded um, and actually arrives at A. And the same happens with the sin of A, which arrives at B. And this way, um, the two actually exchange the um, their first packets for their TCP connection and at some point will end up with the whole TCP connection. Now, this whole mechanism, it's called hole punching, and it's, among other things, again, simplifying, oversimplifying a lot here uh, to overcome firewalls and ads. What we want to achieve with LibPDP and what a lot of people have achieved in the past, again, this is in no way our invention, uh, is that this can happen in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. And the difficulty really is here that A and B um, start this process at the same time so that the two SYN packets somehow cross uh, somewhere in the internet. There are more caveats to this, which I will not go into detail, but I think this simple picture is good to have in mind from now on. All right, cool. So hole punching for LibP2P, I already mentioned a couple of these things, but it's very relevant, especially in the peer-to-peer -peer space, obviously, as we don't have any central servers that we can rely on, right? We really want two peers to connect directly to each other. And the hope for uh, LibP2P to have hole punching is obviously full connectivity, even though, yeah, some NATs and firewalls really don't like us. So that's not going to happen all the way, but we're getting pretty, pretty close. Um, as I said, we're not the first ones to try out hole punching, and actually this is somewhat standardized, um, and those familiar probably know the ICE standard, turn and stun, for example. Now, in addition to the requirements that ICE has, we have a, a couple of others. For example, lib 2 p peer to be a network library, thus we don't want any centralized infrastructure. We want to run on IPv4 and v6. We want to support UDP with quick or TCP, and hopefully in the future WebRTC. And obviously, this should nicely integrate into the entire LibP2P stack. Introducing Project Flare. Project Flare is pretty much just the, the project name for how LibP2P is going to do decentralized hole punching, or is doing decentralized hole punching. And what we came up with is very, very similar to ICE with turn and stun. So those familiar will be reminded many times, and I'll try to draw some connections between the two. You can. Um, separate or you can visualize project flare into pretty much two phases uh, the first phase is where in the scenario where a ultimately wants to connect to b first b has to figure out whether it's actually dialable or not now in the ICE world you would do that with stun in uh, the lippy2b world uh, you would do that with the Audinat protocol i'll go into detail how each of these will work in a little bit now, once determined that one is not dialable, one would find some relay nodes that are public. So some nodes in the network. Now, the important part here is the sum. So we don't rely on specific central relay nodes, but uh, just any. And then we would listen for incoming connections via those relay nodes. Uh, now, the 1.3 here, for, again, for those familiar with ICE, should be reminded of turn. So the relay protocol turn. In the second phase of Project Flare, um, A wants to establish a connection to B. Now, what A would do first is establish a relay connection to B, and over that relay connection, then coordinate the simultaneous dial or the hole punch, so the little magic source that I mentioned earlier. Before we go into how Project Flare works in detail, let's um, quickly summarize the, its current state. So um, today, Project Flare works on top of TCP and UDP with QUIC, and in the future, we would like to support WebRTC. And uh, through some experimentation, we found out that we, we pretty much on like average home routers, we have like a 90% success rate on UDP and QUIC. For TCP, that's slightly lower. Now, this test setup is actually, I think, quite cool. Um, Within Protocol Labs, everyone was asked to run a small binary, which would attempt to hole punch to all other small binaries. And given that Protocol Labs is quite distributed across the globe, um, I think we covered quite a lot of different uh, weird setups everywhere. And with those setups, we roughly achieved a 90% success rate, again, on UDP with Quick. TCP is lower. Now, all of Project Flare is implemented in Go and Rust. It is released in Go. Rust is still a little bit behind. That would be on me. It is included in IPFS and uh, included in the sense that um, all public nodes, once they found out that they're public, run as limited relay nodes. And all private nodes um, can, if they want to, even though that is not enabled by default, punch holes, so enable the whole um, client-side protocols. An important thing to point out here is public nodes run limited relay servers. So they run as limited relay servers. So every public node in the IPFS network basically works as a turn server in the ICE, uh, ICE world, but 
given that we have so many of them, we don't depend on a single one serving all the traffic for the entire network or relaying all the traffic for the entire network. But instead, we have each only taking part, a small, small part of the load. And thus, the whole load, the whole relay work being distributed across all of the relay servers in the network. All right, let's dive into how Project Flare works in detail. And I, I don't definitely don't don't get too close to your screen. I don't expect you to read anything of this. But basically, um, we'll we'll split up this graphic uh, into small parts and walk through each of the steps and thus kind of like learn how each of the protocols work. I just as a quick overview, I think you can read that a little bit. Um, we have multiple participants here. We have A, a relay R, we have B, and some other nodes in the network. And our goal is for A to establish a connection to B. All right, let's go into each of the steps. You might remember the phases here and we'll go into each of them, starting with 1.1. So the first step in Project Flare is for a node to determine whether it's dialable or not, whether it's public or not, whether nodes can reach out to it. And all of this is called the Audinat protocol, and I'm drawing the connection here again to ICE with Stun. So B, what B would do is connect to a bunch of nodes within the network, those are likely the public nodes, and ask those nodes to dial it back. So basically asking, hey, by the way, I don't know whether I'm public. Here are a couple of addresses that I think I'm uh, reachable under. Can you try them out? Then these other nodes will try to dial B. And if they succeed, they will respond to B with, yes, I was able to dial you. This was the other address I reached you under. Or no, I was not able to dial you at all. Now, the, the uppercase here is really the boring part, right? At this point, we know B is dialable in the public, so we don't have to care about hole punching or any of the stuff in this talk, so we can stop right here. In the second case, that is a lot more interesting, as now it shows that B is not dialable, and thus we actually need the whole hole punching stack. Okay, so let's continue on this one. 1. 1.2, the next step. What B will next do, it's not dialable, so it will need to find some relay nodes. Now, um, that is not fully defined in Project Flare, at least not yet, um, in the sense that each of the upper layer users of LibDB can do it in their way. What B would do, or what B is doing in IPFS, is search the Kademlia DHT. You can see that as a black box for now. I will not go into Kademlia, even though I'm happy to in the questions area later on. B will try to find the closest nodes within the network and find the closest public nodes that also offer the relay protocol and then move on to the next step. So basically, 1.2 is find a bunch of other relay nodes in the network. 1.3. <clears throat> Now, the relays that are discovered through 1.2, it will connect to each of them, here represented by R, represented as one single relay. It will establish, B will establish a connection to R and request a reservation. Now, this is basically saying, hey, I'm B, I'm not reachable um, through the public internet or no one can dial me. Would you, dear R, as a public node, please listen for incoming connections in my behalf and then notify me whenever something like that comes in. Now R gets that request, uh, that reservation request, and accepts it. And from now on, there are two things happening. One, B is keeping a constant connection to R. So this established connection up here, it just keeps alive, right? So that could, for example, be a TCP connection. And in addition, B can now announce itself, not by its own address, as that is pretty much useless. It's not reachable through that address, but instead through a relayed address. Now, this is a, a new concept within the LibPP ecosystem, but you can pretty much see it as, hey, I'm B, I'm not publicly reachable, but you can reach me via this relay. This is the address of the relay, and this is my peer ID. So if you tell the relay, hey, I want to connect to B, you will be able to find me. A small note on the connection that needs to keep B kept alive. Again, B is not dialable, so B needs to keep this connection alive to R, because otherwise, in case there's something coming from some other node to R, R cannot reach out to B. Right? It cannot establish a new connection to B because B is behind a firewall on that. So B needs to keep this established connection earlier, needs to keep it alive. All right, this concludes phase one. Now we'll go into phase two. Remember, again, let me remind you, A, some node A will try to, wants to connect to B. Both of them, for this scenario, even though there are different other scenarios where you also need hole punching, both of them are within some home network behind firewalls and that. So, um, A, through this address that B earlier announced through some mechanism out there, there are many also supported by LibPP, um, A will first of all reach out to the relay, the relay that B is listening via. It will establish a connection and it will request a connection to B from the relay. Now re the relay will reach out to B 
Again, this is the connection that B keeps alive because R could otherwise never talk to B. So R forwards that request to B. B accepts the connection request and R forwards the acceptance to A. And from now on, A and B can use the relay connection over R to exchange bytes. Again, I want to stress that, that all the bytes sent here go through the relay here and are forwarded to B. Right? Okay, so now A has a way to, establish, uh, to communicate with B. Now comes um, phase two, step two, and this is really the, the, secret, uh, the secret sauce that I mentioned earlier, the synchronization to make sure we are hole plunging at the same time. Again, we have A and B here communicating over R. Everything in this first box is happening over this relay connection, right? A, R, B. What's happening first is A sends a sync message to B. Once it sends it out, it will start a timer and will wait and measure the time until B sends the sync message back, basically just echoing the message. Now, through this mechanism, A notes the round trip time over R to B. What it will do next, it will send a connect message to B. Um, and A will do after half a round trip time, again, to do the math here, half a round trip time is exactly the time the connect message needs to be. So A, after half a round trip time, will try to dial B. And B, once it receives the connect message, will try to dial A. And it, if everything works out and the round trip time was correctly measured, this will be at the same time. Because, yeah, A, after half a round trip time, is exactly the time that this connect message took to get over here. Um, so uh, B will then, when the connect message arrives, dial A, and A will dial B, and hopefully they'll do so at the same time. And at this point in time, we're exactly back to the initial image that we had earlier, where I said that these two SYN packets need to be co coordinated. And through the entire mechanism earlier, now these two happen roughly at the same time. Each of them will punch a hole in their firewall. The SYN packets from A and the SYN packet from B will meet somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the internet. The SYN packet from B will be able to go through the punched hole through router A and will reach A and the other way around to B. And from here on, you'll have a connection, in this case a TCP connection, even though that would also work with UDP and QUIC. Cool, so that is the whole process. Um, I, I want to stress once more, obviously this is an oversimplification given that we only have 20 minutes. There's a lot more to explore here and um, yeah, so next steps, in case you're interested, is obviously stay around for the questions time. That would be cool. Um, we have an extensive documentation on docs.lipidp.io. We have a forum where pretty much the whole community um, yeah, communicates. And that's also, I think, a great way to, to search for, for past questions that have been persisted there. Lipidp, I want to stress this once more, is fully open source, both the specification as well as all the implementations. You can find the specification on GitHub, uh, lipidp slash specs, and you can also find a roadmap within there. Um, you'll have a chance to ask questions, obviously, um, but also if you want to reach out to me directly and if you don't want to do that over the forum, you can reach me with MX Inton on most platforms and via my website. Cool. With all that said, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the organizers um, of FOSDEM 2022 and thank you all for coming to my talk.